Uh, let's go back to the phone call from a 571 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. This is Dan Norton from California. Dan from uh, California. Ram, What's uh, on your mind? Uh, first of all, on my introduction, instead of saying I'm Dan from California, would it be all right if I say I'm Dan Norton 1 from YouTube? Sure, you just did. Okay, just for future reference. All right, so in a couple of my calls make a note. before... Wait, did you write okay. that down, Bradley? Uh, so in a couple of my calls from before, you brought up uh, Social Security in connection with Ayn Rand. And so on that, I think there's nothing wrong with her taking it or nothing hypocritical because her view was not that Dan, when, um, so when, 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 when did we have this conversation? Just so uh, we're all on the same page. October of 2021 was the first time when you brought up the issue of Social Security okay. in one of my calls. Okay. And it came up again last October in my last call. All right. So uh, you're breaking tradition so. by calling uh, mid mid year. That's fine. Okay. Okay. I think I remember now. Okay, so you take issue with me bringing up Ayn Rand being on uh, Social Security because I said it was hypocritical, and you think it's not hypocritical because this is the system that you're dealt with, and she paid into it, presumably, uh, because you need to, because it's taxation, and so why shouldn't she take it? Is that is that the point? Yeah, basically. You didn't, you didn't say she was hypocritical, but oh. I got the sense that was... That was likely your view. Oh, and no, I, I mean, actually, no, I agree with you. Like, you know, the, like, people say like, hey, if you want to uh, have higher taxes, why don't you just pay more in taxes? And I'm like, no, that's not the point of taxes. Taxes are uh, for everybody to, to, to pay in. They're, they're supposed to be a policy. And I don't, I don't think you're hypocritical if you take uh, Social Security, even though you have been arguing against, um, uh, you know, uh, government uh, programs like Social Security. I mean, it's possible, and I, you know, will uh, cop to not having read uh, Ayn Rand since I was much, much, much younger. You're good. Uh, but it's possible that she, you know, had broader sort of like uh, 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 feelings about how, what it does to you to take uh, money from the government that maybe I would find to be hypocritical, but I, I, I would have been surprised if I had talked about it being hypocrisy. No, I think the point of her taking that money is not so much hypocritical, but how effective and important it is in our society, because presumably, right. She had access to all of the, uh, you know, a wealth, uh, growing power that like, uh, the stock market, uh, would have provided or the the free market and the fact that she needed to take social security i think is indicative of like a lot of people in this country in fact as you know i've said i'm sure on one of our calls or at least in times i've talked about social security in the past that it, that uh when it was introduced it kept two-thirds of our elderly out of poverty so i think the reason why i would illustrate that point was um even ayn rand knew the value of social security and needed it. Okay. So no, actually, I, so I would dispute the last point that she needed it. She did not need it. She died wealthy and she left, I think around a half million dollars to her heir. I mean, she was a very wealthy author. She was getting lots of royalties from her books. Uh, so she didn't need the money, but she had a right to it. Some of the money. Oh, I agree with you. She through. definitely had a right to it. And I, it, if it was up to me, if she really uh, was that wealthy, uh, then I, hopefully our taxation clawed back, you know, uh, the money in such a way so that it wasn't, uh, you know, that if, if she was receiving income, uh, you know, in that age, it, it was clawing back some of that money, but okay. I have no problem with, uh, wealthy people getting social security as long as we have taxation that, uh, you know, uh, make sure that they're paying their fair share of taxes. Well, when I say she had a right to it, I don't mean she had like a political right to it because I don't think anyone has a right to live off of other people's money. What I mean is she had a moral claim to it or a moral right. Like if, if money is forcibly taken away from you, then I think it's reasonable to, if you get some of that money back, then that seems perfectly fair and reasonable. 
but the money should not be coercively taken in the first place. That was her objection to Social Security. Mm. It wasn't that you shouldn't take it if you can get it, but you shouldn't be forced to pay into this system in the first place. Right. But, well, but I mean, but um, that is the uh, dues we pay for society. And we have decided as a society that we don't want two thirds of our elderly living in poverty. And so uh, we have decided to have taxes. Now, of course, I would also argue uh, further that, uh, A, um, we would have no society uh, as we know it without taxes. B, that it's not her money. It's not your money. It is. Uh, and if it was, you would be able to burn it. But you're not able to burn it. It's illegal to burn your dollars, uh, as money. you know, because it is Uncle Sam's money. And we use it as a currency. And the fact is that currency has value because the one entity that has a monopoly of power only accepts one thing <clears throat> in terms of uh, paying its taxes. And that is the dollar. And that's why uh, money has value in that sense. Uh, uh, taxation is what gives that money value as opposed to like puka beads. Well, I, I mean, I don't. I, I think the value of money comes from the things that it represents, the goods and services that it represents. Like, if you have inflation in Zimbabwe or wherever, wherever, or Argentina, where you you have people with barrel wheelbarrow fulls of money that represent nothing, uh, it's it's worthless. So, money in itself, you, you can print money, and our government does that. You know, can print trillions of dollars, yes. and then we get inflation. What really gives money its value, I think, is the goods and services that. But the point create. is, is why does someone give up their goods and services for the U.S. dollar? All right, let's just make it simple so that we can talk about like what happens in our daily basis. Why do they give that up? Why do they take U.S. dollars as opposed to something else that might be valuable to them? The reason why they do it is because money is the best uh, U.S. dollar particularly when you live in the U S that has value outside of obviously our borders, but let's just say this, you know, uh, so that we can limit this so that we can really understand this concept. The reason why we only take uh, dollars for our membership, let's say to get the fun half, the reason why we only take dollars instead of like stuff like, you know, I don't know, um, uh, liquid IV packets or whatever it is, stuff that I consume is because those dollars are not only fungible, and I can use them everywhere. It's because everybody pays their taxes in dollars. It's the one consistent thing that gives value to our dollars. In fact, uh, you should read David Graeber's book about money. Uh, the late David Graeber, he explains. This is how uh, the, the Roman Empire uh, would uh, use their currency. They would go into a place. I'm not suggesting that we should be imperialist, but this is, illustrates how the value of money. And they would say the the uh, the Roman currency had no value, you know, uh, thousands of miles away, except for the fact that the Romans said, incidentally, we're here. We want to buy a, a chicken for our soldiers. You, we're going to give you this money. And they, they go, like, well, why, well, why would I want Roman coins? How's that going to help me? And they go, oh, incidentally, we're also charging a tax and you can only pay in the Roman coins. So we're going to give you two coins. We're going to take one back for tax. Just the, you know, I'm being, uh, you know, this is just an, as an example. It's not specific. And uh, that's what gives it the value. And then, you know, that's why with those two coins are going to actually be worth it for you for, for chickens. Everybody's uh, going to be paying taxes in Roman coins. So you're going to be able to trade uh, Roman coins uh, for things of value because ultimately it's the one thing that's going to keep you out of jail because you got to pay your taxes. Well, I do think money could have value even if there were no taxes. Like if you imagine uh, an island scenario, like we've, we've talked about some island well, hypotheticals. scenarios in previous calls. Like if, if you imagine people are on an island, like at, at the beginning, they could just barter with each other and there might not be money at all involved. But That's right. it becomes inconvenient to, to just have to barter everything. So if you create some medium of exchange like money or like, like dollar bills or gold, that everyone agrees on, then it facilitates transactions. Well, that's the beauty of being on a tiny island. I mean, I remember when I was in college, I went to Jamaica for spring break because uh, it was discounts because of riots in uh, Kingston, I think, at the time. And 
we had no currency except for these little plastic shells in the hotel. But here's the point. We live in a country of hundreds of millions of people and not everybody is going to agree on the same currency and agree that we're all part of some type of thing. That's why someone from New York who doesn't know anybody in California um, can use the American dollar. Now, it's true on your tiny little island scenario, people can decide like, hey, we're just going to use coconut shells uh, as, as a currency and we're going to go back and forth. But the fact of the matter is, is that like you cannot have a society that is in any way, even like even remotely more specific without a currency. I just want to drill down on this point a little bit, Caller, because like we can do the Robinson Crusoe stuff, um, but you love money so much you want to take it out of two, deprive two thirds of elderly people of it. The greenback in America, when did that form? Do you know? Well, I don't want to deprive elderly of the money. I want them to keep what they earn. Sure, sure, whatever. I think you're let, the one who let actually me, let, let's wants to deprive them of the money let's by Let's get back to history. Away. Okay, so greenbacks. When did that form in America? When did that? When did those emerge? Greenbacks. I believe that was around the time of the Civil War. Right, and do you the uh, that went up and down in value a lot during the Civil War? Was that because of the goods and services, or was it maybe because of uh, how well the Union Army was doing? I'm not familiar with the the reason that the value of the greenback went up and down. I look into it. I mean, I don't know the. I think the point well, is, I, that I, we're I mean, trying I think to... the government should. It, it shouldn't mandate a currency. Like, I think there should be a free market in currency, and there used to be, like, banks could mm -hmm. issue their own notes. I think in, in Scotland. Why do you think Canada, that changed? That the. Well, the government, why did the government start taking over the currency? Well, why do like you think it was, why do you think um, all having, everybody having disparate currencies uh, was uh, uh, changed? Uh, I don't, I don't know the, the economic history of the U.S., well, but I know in Canada and Scotland, there was free banking and there were far fewer runs on the banks Right. And okay. Why do you so think forth. that changed? So they were actually better than the U.S. Why do you think that changed? Well, I think that this gets into some deeper philosophy, but I, what no, I'm no, no, not philosophy. No, no, no. I'm, not, I'm specifically actually trying to keep it out of philosophy, and I'm trying to ground it into reality. Why do you think that that system of everybody issuing different currencies for stuff wouldn't have been effective for what? merchants wanted let's say well i don't know that it wasn't effective why do you so think it I, went I away do you think it was do you think it was just it was stomped out because of the, like the authoritarian nature of of government well i this is where i do think philosophy could be relevant. no 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 i don't history. want philosophy i want actually reality <laughs> reality but philosophy Not, applies to reality no 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 i don't want something reality. that applies to reality i want the description of why that happened, because clearly you have spent a lot of time thinking about this. So surely you have gone back. You just cited to me real things in history where you had disparate sources of money. And I'm asking you, why didn't you keep reading to see why it went away? Well, what I was about to say about the philosophy, I think might help explain it. Then uh, I don't want to hear about philosophy. Did you read the history or no? I read some history, including okay. the history of Dan philosophy. number one from uh, YouTube. What I would like you to do is read that and then come back and summarize it for us. All right. Thanks, that man. That be my homework. Okay, appreciate right. the call. Thanks.